welcome everybody. My name is Boris and I will share the screen. So we are all on the same page and those who would not be able to attend potentially would be able to have this presentation uh, reviewed. Welcome, and I do appreciate uh, your attendance. Uh, my name is Boris. Uh, my co-presenter, Paul Wixi, Dr. Paul Wixi, who is a CEO of Farsight Security, uh, may or may not be able to attend, but uh, we would be able to handle it. And if you have some questions to Paul directly, uh, he would be happy to answer. A little bit about me and Paul. Uh, I am sure that you had our uh, little bios uh, read on the uh, website uh, from, uh, from the first. So therefore I will not talk about us uh, a lot. If you want to learn more, you just Google uh, Paul or me and I'm happy to uh, accept your uh, LinkedIn invites. So with that, we will start to talk about protective DNS, why it matters, how to deploy it on-prem, and how to take control and defense back into your hands. I'm sure uh, during the course of the, this conference or any other, uh, you probably uh, heard uh, a lot about different solutions, about different methods. And very often when I do hear this kind of uh, uh, stuff, uh, it always occurs to me that a very, very strong underlying assumption is being put in place. We put this solution, and only if the adversary just walk through this, the adversary will be dropped in our, uh, in our trap, will fall in our trap. And I also was thinking, why would the adversary go? Adversary's uh, objective is not go and fall into your trap. Adversary's objective is to avoid any trap possible. So if we agree on that, then the fundamental question would be, is there anything Hey, Boris. Oh, there. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. You need to make your screen full. We can see some of your desktop icons. Oh, you see it. Uh, that's on purpose, but I'm happy to make it bigger. Is it better? Okay. Yeah, that's better. If it's on purpose, it's up to you. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'm fine if you see some of the icons, uh, but yeah, let's do it uh, bigger. So, where was I? I was asking myself a question. Uh, is there anything we can find which would not depend on our assumption, just go this way and we will, uh, we will catch you? Uh, and apparently, there are things. So, with that, this is what we will be talking today about. There are many, many uh, cloud DNS solutions and cloud DNS providers. DNS is one of the fundamental protocol. Open DNS, DNS filter, Cloudflare, Quad9, and all the different squads, uh, Quad1, Quad2, Quad4, Quad8, Quad, Quad, whatever you want to see it, right? And they claim they provide some filtering where they understand your request uh, or, or answer, and based on that, whatever they believe is dangerous will answer what we call dishonestly. And it was done on purpose, because if something is not desirable, whatever the policy is, perhaps it is good for you and for your constitu uh, constituency not to go there, because a lot of harm uh, we know comes from the internet. It comes to the point that uh, in the US, for example, uh, earlier this year in March, it was a directive from the President Biden as well as from uh, different uh, cyber uh, defense bodies, which encourage businesses and public to use what they dubbed as protective DNS. Interestingly enough, they only mentioned cloud-based solutions. It's not only US which came up with, uh, with, with this notion uh, earlier this year. In UK, for example, where I am today, uh, this notion came, uh, goes back to 2017. So notion of protective DNS comes to some uh, 17. 
2017, and it still is not available for private sector. We will touch on that. So this is kind of a problem uh, a statement. And the, the furthermore, we can say that um, if you don't have a contractual uh, uh, relationship with uh, your third party provider, uh, some people could accept that, but some businesses especially may not necessarily. And when you outsource this to the cloud, we claim you basically lose the control of your environment. And what you will be talking today would be what we call DNS firewall or RPZ, response policy zone. And this was a uh, uh, an engine uh, and, and being used in DNS filtering policy. So in this presentation, I will cover the motifs, methods, and context to justify on-premise protective DNS. Not only I would do that, I will show you how exactly you can build it by yourself. So if I can do it uh, with you during the uh, uh, second part of this presentation, second hour, in literally in 10, 15 minutes, uh, you would definitely understand that the same power you can take in your hands, bring to your organizations and use everything which comes as a byproduct with this DNS defense. All right. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about DNS. If you are not much familiar with this, uh, that is fine because you don't need to. You go, you open your browser, you type Google and you go, or oh, whatever you, uh, uh, you like. And this is how your internet life uh, might start to, or maybe not yours, but majority of people uh, in the cyberspace. So DNS was invented in 1986 by Dr. Paul Macapetris. Dr. Mo uh, Paul Macapetris uh, uh, is a, uh, a board member of Farsight Security. So inventor of DNS is part of Farsight Security. It was designed as a highly distributed system for reliability. I would like you to think about it. It was designed as a highly distributed system. Why I try to emphasize this for you? For very simple reason. Because if you use something outside of its design purpose, it will fail. It may work nicely, but it will fail. Uh, when I serve an uh, uh, army, uh, we had a joke. Lieutenant comes to the captain and asks, hey, captain, uh, sir, uh, can tanks fly? And captain says, are you stupid? How tanks can fly? Of course, tanks don't fly. And Lieutenant says, well, General said that tanks can fly. And the captain says, well, maybe not very, very far. So yes, tanks can fly, but not very, very far. If you don't still believe me that if you use something outside of a design purpose, it would fail. Look at recent uh, disappearance of the Facebook, for example. Okay. One typo somewhere from the home office in the basement made Facebook disappeared. Look at uh, other uh, uh, fundamental and uh, glorious fiascos of the concentrated uh, uh, cloud uh, solutions. If something is used outside of design purpose, it will fail. So if you rely on something that is very concentrated, and at the same time was designed to be distributed for reliability and uh, high availability, you just expect that someday the failure will reach you dearly. So DNS is a fundamental protocol, the same way as BGP. And your life in the internet starts with this too. First, you need to understand where you need to go and then BGP will take over, actually bring you there. So one is a, an address book and another one is a roadmap. Who controls DNS and BGP? Control the internet. Once again, think of Facebook recently within a couple of last months. 
So if you cannot fully control BGP, but if you're autonomous system uh, AS, uh, uh, system, then you actually control that. But if somebody hijacks you, then you're probably out of that control. That is fundamental point to think, but you actually can uh, take control about naming in your own hands. So you don't rely on cloud solutions, but you can do it yourself. And the argument we usually think uh, uh, here uh, is that, okay, uh, we need skills, we need, we need expertise to run that. And what about, uh, um, what about reliability? Well, at home, I run two DNS recursive servers. They're both running on uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, of course, you don't need to use Raspberry Pi if you have 100,000 uh, uh, people organization, but there are many other solutions which I would touch on. Right. Once again, it is highly distributed by design. That was its purpose. And those who control DNS and BGP would control the cyberspace. And I would like you to take that control and everything which comes as a byproduct. A little bit about firewalls, because uh, this is something that you would need uh, to link together. Firewalls. Before, the internet was trusted environment. Uh, people knew each other and then it grew up exponentially and, and now we see what we have. And fundamentally it appears that no matter what we do, we cannot achieve the security. In fact, you cannot prove security positive. There is no test which you can devise to demonstrate that some system is actually secure. You only can demonstrate that something is insecure because you could break it. But if no matter how hard you try, you couldn't break it, the question about security remains open. So that's why we tend to uh, take, the, to take uh, the analogy of the physical world into digital one. So we invented the firewalls. Here are them. And here are us. And even that doesn't work much, right? Because you are assuming that, you know what? They only need to go through this trap and then we will catch them. Well, they don't need to go through that trap. And the firewall is a hole in the wall. You understand that, right? So when I was uh, 20 something uh, years younger, uh, over dial-up connection, I was able to map internal networks of my company. Uh, we didn't call it Red Team at that time, but I was able to map the internal network of my company being outside of the firewall on the dial-up link. So what I would like to say is, should you have some knowledge and a little bit of motivation, firewall is not a deterrent, but Firewall concept is very important because it does enforce policy between us and them. Okay, so I'm sure you understand that. Again, what I say is extremely simplified, but I don't want to make it so complicated that you fall asleep. I would like you to be encouraged by what I say. I see a couple of chat uh, uh, messages here. Let me check whether there are questions or not. We need to use presentation mode. This is to me, and this is please, yes. Okay, so everything is for you uh, to follow. And I did the presentation mode. I need to look at the left side, uh, Grace, because you know I need to remember what I would be talking about before and make this uh, slides uh, flow nicer. Okay, talking about nice flow, let's talk about something that I already mentioned several times. So. Protective DNS, UK government since 2017, US government till uh, from uh, uh, 2021, uh, other uh, governments in the world also follow that. So everyone now calls it uh, protective DNS. But what exactly that is? Uh, I don't want you to believe that this is some uh, another kind of uh, term invented. It is invented term, but it has something that we can actually define and describe. For example, unlike, uh, I don't know, zero trust. If you ask somebody, what is zero trust? 
instead of telling you what it is, because nobody knows, they tell what it does based on their opinion, right? You may, you may try. So ask somebody who pretends to be a, a zero trust expert and ask, what is zero trust? And they say, for me, zero trust does this. Or instead they say, for me, zero trust is, and now it is a long description of what it does. If you cannot describe something or define something in, I don't know, three, five lines of text conveying the reason that of that existence, that means something is fundamentally wrong with that. So with protective DNS, there is nothing wrong here. Protective DNS, it's usually an umbrella term, which defines a security solution which simply examines DNS queries and answers based on the name and destination addresses and enforces the policy, whether to let it go or not let it go. And when we say policy, it all depends on how you define your own policy, whether it is malicious content, whether it is no desirable content, uh, whether it is something else. Right. So once again, protective DNS, it's a set of security solutions that use DNS as an engine, right, as an engine to respond based on the policy. It's a policy enforcement device, same as a firewall. So protective DNS in another world, what we learned from many, many, many years ago, I think it was uh, back to 2010 when uh, engine of uh, uh, DNS firewall was invented by Vixi and Schneider, uh, we call it D uh, DNS firewall, exactly the device which enforces policy, us and them us and them, good or bad. And good or bad is based on the judgment and judgment based on your policy, okay? So that's what uh, protective DNS is. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about protective DNS. So how exactly that is being done? Um, first of all, uh, you, if you use DNS, you definitely understand uh, questions and answers. Almost everything starts with DNS, right? You start your uh, journey on the internet, you don't remember uh, IPs, not to mention IPv6, but even IPv4, uh, only if you're a sysadmin. But even if you uh, go through the browser and you're a regular user, almost everything starts with that. Your toaster, I don't know, your watch, your, your, your fridge, uh, they, they, they would reach a DNS server, okay? So what do bots and any other malicious uh, uh, wear on your system? Now, understanding those requests, okay, questions, okay, and potential answers would in many cases prevent that malicious flow. And I will show you uh, uh, those uh, uh, things, okay? And that, could prevent a lot of badness on the internet. So I say that, and I would like to back up my, uh, my statements by some facts. There have been a lot of studies done, okay, including those at Farsight Security. Uh, we observe the internet on DNS since 2010, and we have a large database going back into the history. And we observe those domains and how internet from domain naming perspectives uh, is evolving. We did the studies. What we found was that if a domain is about to die in one week, most likely it would be block listed in the first hour, 50% of those. Another 80% would be within 24 hours. So if you are about to die in one week, in one day, 80% of those, right? 80% of those would disappear through block listing. So they could be there, but if you're in a block list of some reputable vendor, uh, most likely uh, for you, it's a, uh, it's a doom day. So, so, so your domain just doesn't exist because a lot of technologies, including regular firewalls would use those block lists. 
And the question is, what you're going to do in between, between when something appears on the internet and somebody would understand whether it's good or bad. So that is a window of opportunity for uh, for, for the criminals, uh, nation states, uh, organized crime, and everyone who has malicious intent. This is not the only one, not the only uh, kind of use case, but it is very, very um, prevalent on the on the internet. There are many, we can touch on those as well. Um, another study mentioned uh, that uh, up to 80% of newly uh, new assets on the internet are not safe to deal with business with, up to 70%. Some other studies quoted uh, up to 90%, okay? So I would say, if you say between 60 and 90% of the assets, new assets on the internet are not safe, you would not make a terrible mistake, okay? So 60 to 90, it's, uh, you say, 75 plus minus 15%. Well, very good experiments in physics when you try to do it uh, uh, kind of manually uh, may have this kind of uh, error margin. If you talk about medicine, probably uh, almost the same. Uh, very precise studies are very, very expensive. So. The 70% is the figure you need to keep in mind, plus minus 10, 15% error margin, okay, for new assets. What we also know from the study is that up to 90% of malware use DNS for the communication, up to 90%. So now the picture is getting quite clear. So if you control the DNS, a fundamental protocol of the internet, you would be able to control the badness, or maybe you would not control the badness, you would control the goodness, you would control the way your environment would be trying to be tricked by the malicious actors to go somewhere which is not safe. Remarkably, Another study says up to 70%, and I believe the precise figure was 68%. I don't like 68% thing, right? It tells usually that it was measured with such preciseness, which in this particular case uh, uh, is impossible to do. So I would say up to 70% of organizations do not monitor DNS traffic. So if DNS is a fundamental protocol and you don't monitor it, then then a lot of investment you're actually doing, pretending to have a compliance program and cyber defense program, uh, I would say uh, may not be really uh, uh, sufficient or useful, okay? You can start with something which is very simple and powerful, fundamental things, and then you can go uh, on the peripheries uh, uh, of your defenses if you actually know what, uh, what that is. And now, the DNS observations, it's a data, data which do not lie. It's not speculations. You see something and you understand this observation is the accurate measurement. Okay, uh, that is about DNS, but everything would be cool if we didn't know anything what Mr. Snowden shared with the world. And now what we have is a lot of very unconsidered solutions, very powerful though, uh, have been popping up here and there. Not only they pop up pretending to defend you or your privacy, they specifically design to impede the security. Okay, so people believe, okay, either you have privacy or security. And I would say you can have both. But if you design something to specifically impede the security, you will. For example, DNS over HTTP, encrypted client, hello, quick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are specifically designed to circumvent security controls. So now, you pretend to uh, advocate for privacy, but at the same time, you impede something that may enforce the privacy of your communication. So, and I would suggest that this is actually a very interesting uh, 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 topic to debate, 
right? There are uh, various uh, advocates on both sides. One want to have encryption everywhere, and others say, you know what, then we can just pack and go home because it wouldn't be able to protect you. Because if you got compromised through that very secure encrypted channel, your adversary on another side would know everything what you are doing from the channel which we cannot even look into. We cannot protect you from those you want to be protected from. This is something uh, as a topic for, for, uh, for, 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 another, for another day. But what I would like to say, just think about it and whether what you do with this privacy so-called solutions would help you uh, to respond to the incidents because that is what you're passionate about. This is why you are here and this is why uh, we are talking about it. All right, with this, let's talk a little bit more about protective DNS. If it is not bypassed, it's a fantastic and very powerful instrument for you. Your endpoint for the server uh, in your data center or toaster in your kitchen, we believe we need to assume might be compromised already. And if it is compromised, it is not under your control. What is? Well, if adversary wants to do something, they would need to use two fundamental protocols, whether they want it or not. They would need to use DNS and BGP, right? To come and go, and they need to know where to go to. So they would reach DNS server. So now if you understand what the DNS server responding to your environment, you would be able to, to pick up very, very early signals. Uh, in your uh, jargon, professional jargon, we, uh, we, we call it IOC, indicators of compromise. And I argue that it is too late. Indicator of compromise is when something is already broken. I would argue that we can offer you indicators of attack when nothing yet been compromised. How beautiful that is. You operate uh, in, a, in a concept of the kill chain. You believe that everything starts with the reconnaissance. And I argue that it is not. And the reason for this is very simple. Of billions of targets on the internet, an adversary would want to target you to do the reconnaissance. It has been a lot of thinking done before the target was chosen, before you see those signals, the early signals of scanning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Adversary has scarce resources. Some may have greater resources than you do, but they're not unlimited. They make those decisions before they do recon. Let's see how we can move left over the kill chain and see whether it is even possible. For that, I need to give you a little bit, uh, uh, an excurs uh, of the DNS architecture. Remember I mentioned it's, uh, it's, it's highly distributed. And if you try to use it centralized, uh, then uh, one way or another, it will be broken. It was not designed for this. It was not designed that the whole world would go to squat uh, some uh, DNS server because once it's dead, everything is dead because they serve many who would provide an answer and they serve many who would ask questions. And this is a focal point. And that focal point is not by design. It is by financial interest. And if you believe otherwise, raise your hand and we can have a little discussion here. But how it works. On the right corner at the bottom, this is the question. This is your kids, this is your boss, this is yourself, your fridge, a toaster, whatever that could be. And they ask a stub resolver, so DNS daemon on your system. 
which would go and ask recursive DNS, what we call full resolver. Now, between stub resolver and recursive DNS server, which would go across the internet and fetch the answer for you, if that answer is not already in cache previously done so, okay, the recursive DNS server would see the PII. Okay, so now just imagine, just imagine, right? Uh, people talk about uh, privacy, all right? So they do encryption, but they ask some non contracted party on the internet, which would know who you are. Okay, so how private that could be? Yes. Nobody on the, uh, in the middle would be able to see what is being asked. But how would you trust your cloud DNS provider not being under control of the adversary you try to hide in the first place? If you run your own recursive uh, uh, server, that PII, the, the IP, MAC addresses in some cases, it depends how your network is uh, being constructed, will not be linked to the internet if properly set up. So your recursive will go to different authority servers and bring the answer to you. The only server would know what was asked would be the authority server of the final destination. But because there are so many of those you would be reaching, right? There is no central authority that would connect the data about your questions even though those questions are not encrypted. I'm an architect, there's always trade-off and you would decide which exact solution you would want to have. I let it think, uh, uh, think in your mind a little bit and I check what is here, all good. Yes, thank you, Grace. With your help, I guess we are progressing uh, well. Okay, so this is how you have the control. Okay, and this, how you also have a protection. There are two uh, additional protocols in uh, DNS, I'll touch on them as well, which provides you not only uh, control, but protection. So recursive DNS server, you can collect the observation for analysis, and then you create a RPZ, which is a response policy zone, and you ask your recursive DNS, to answer certain queries the way you want it. It could be an X domain, not existing domain. It could be 127.0.0.1 to think the communication. So now you don't need firewalls. You don't need anything else. If let's say your environment, uh, let's say you received an email. Okay, you click on the link, or maybe not you, maybe one of you 100,000 employees in your organization, click on the uh, link, and that domain was recently popped up, and uh, uh, user actually reached that uh, uh, destination, and it was uh, C2 uh, ransomware distribution key uh, center. All right, in 15 minutes, uh, you have it spread laterally, and you're done. So your firewall may not necessarily be able to handle millions and millions of rules, but the DNS has been designed for that. So you can hand on my Raspberry Pi, on my Raspberry Pi, I handle over 10 million uh, rules through RPZ. I will show you how to have it, okay? And I have no uh, degradation of services. Now, if I am in a large organization, I may have something bigger than that, I may build my own DNS server on as powerful hardware as I can. But at par, if your firewall is running on A, the A hardware for the DNS would be outperforming in orders any firewall based on rules. And now you have control and protection should you run your own recursive DNS. But this is the problem. This is how you lose your control because now every application, every browser or any or most are trying to use their own recursive DNSs, 
and they uh, speak a DOH, uh, DNS over HTTPS. So they basically design to circumvent any of your defenses at times without control of your user or yourself. So now, if your system is being compromised by those who you try to hide from, then all your environment would also be compromised. We know how it's going on, right? You're in incident response. And you should assume that it, uh, uh, it, it could happen. And it does, it is happening. So now, this is what, what we are now facing. At the moment, this kind of uh, 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 scenario is quite dangerous, uh, not only for home, small offices, but for large organizations as well. And uh, the, the, the next notion, or at least the pressure uh, is growing uh, towards uh, revealing where those uh, recursive uh, DOH speaking hosts are. So big organizations, security focused and security aware would stop those communication at the firewall, at IP level. Now, why it has happened? Well, uh, one can argue, continue to argue uh, about the privacy. Okay, but uh, who controls the DNS? Control the internet, it's fundamental protocol. So somebody wants you to use them as their DNS provider. How that could be private? Yes, they offer encrypted channel, but you don't form any contractual obligation with that third party. How that could be private? I will not argue this case, but I would like you to actually think about this because it's very, very important. Now, let's take a little bit, uh, a little bit, maybe not on tangent, but on something that also will help us build the case for motivation and uh, reasons to use your own, uh, your own private, your own private uh, recursive DNS. Okay, so it's part of the design of the distributed infrastructure. Only you who runs the private uh, uh, recursive DNS would see PII of your constituency, the uh, personally identifiable information like IPs, etc. Okay, and uh, participating in the uh, in the uh, distributed environment, it was exactly uh, how it was designed in, uh, and matured over the years. So now, now let's take a look at how we deal with badness. Uh, many are very proud that they do takedowns. When I work for the uh, largest UK bank here in, in London, uh, our best time was near 24 hours. Okay, so you remember we had a study that said that uh, if something is bad and about to die because of the block listing, right, in one week, 80% of those would be block listed in a day. Okay, but then in the between, you still need to do something and you don't know what to do because all your technology still don't know, right? So now in 24 hours, you will take down something, but statistically it's useless because it's already, most of them are block listed. So you spend effort on something which is not very effective, okay? You probably have a team, you spend money, you, you, you say how good you are, and you're doing practically a useless thing on average, statistically, okay? Because all the badness happens in between. There are more studies done that criminals, when they pop up on the internet, they reap the, uh, the fruits of their labor in the first several hours, okay? So something popped up, they reap the uh, benefits, then started a uh, block list in here, and then you go and you uh, take it down. But it's not necessary because that is already mostly abundant. Or you will say uh, reputational perspectives. Yes, perhaps this is a very strong argument. You don't want to have your brand infringement somewhere on the internet, but please don't tell this is for security reason. Because you ask the budget for security, but in fact, you use it for something else. And if you use something 
outside of its design purpose, it will fail. So maybe your boss is sitting on this meeting, next time will ask you exactly the same question, it will not give you the budget for that. So be honest and understand the evolution of badness and how we can better uh, distribute our defenses because our uh, resources are scarce. So far end, the takedowns, long time, lack of cooperation, and basically it doesn't work as effectively as many in industry try to present. Okay, it works in some cases, but if you take the average and randomly pick it up, it's pretty useless. And it's useless for the reasons I already described. This is not what I come up with uh, just before this meeting to convince you. These are the studies which, uh, if you reach me out, uh, I give you the reference, okay, for those. It was done by vendors, it was done by non-vendors, it was done by uh, academics. So they, on average, because they, they consider different data sets during different times, etc. So they're not the same. It's not like physics, you drop the ball and here's UG, right, 9.8. Uh, but on average, whenever you look, see, it's like universe, right? Whenever you look on average, you see the same uh, uh, white noise, which are uh, things uh, coming from the Big Bang, right? If you, if you believe in science, right? So that's what it is. If on average you look at the internet, those spots of deadness have approximately the same uh, uh, average figures. Okay, let's talk about now uh, a near end, your uh, 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 endpoint defenses. I don't know, antivirus, whatever that is, right? Um, it's not cost effective. If let's say you have an organization of 100,000 users, okay? And if you buy a license for antivirus for 50 bucks, this may eat your uh, a large chunk of your of your uh, security budget, right? And there's so many things need to be done. And in fact, in fact, if you take a new code and put it on Virus Total, you know what happened, right? <laughs> Most of the time, for weeks and months, uh, the, the malicious code which just encrypted your system, right? Uh, couldn't be recognized by uh, by an army of antivirus. I don't want to, um, you know, uh, spoil your parade. What I would like to say is, it is high cost, and benefit is yet to be realized. So cost benefit analysis, I am an architect, I would like to do some optimization. How would I optimize? Can I run my system without antivirus? Uh, I can. Okay, because I understand perhaps how to run it. Can an average user run this uh, without antivirus? Perhaps, but you would need to educate those uh, users and perhaps that would be uh, better than having an antivirus which wouldn't recognize the malicious code anyway, right? It is a debatable thing and we can take it offline if you like uh, or go to my uh, LinkedIn profile and have a look at a couple of articles uh, I have written there or maybe my blog post, etc. And if you have some uh, uh, strong argument for that, let debate it. I think it's time. Our industry is in crisis, okay? We come up with some crazy ideas which don't work by time of uh, implementation. Uh, uh, the solution is already obsolete and we need to have something and that something is understanding what is actually going on. And that's why at the very beginning I mentioned, let's use fundamental thing, the things which cannot be avoidable. No matter how hard you try to break the speed of light, you wouldn't be able to do it in principle, okay? So you cannot use internet without those fundamental protocols. Then how it was designed. Or you need to design another internet with different protocols. You may call them different way. But if we agree that DNS is fundamental protocol, this is where protective DNS, so DNS firewall or RPZ, which is engine or, or heart of protective DNS, which we call, that is uh, kudos to Paul Vixie, uh, my friend and my boss, uh, uh, take down in the middle. 
If you cannot avoid not going to DNS, then put a DNS server there. I have Raspberry Pi and I have 10 million rules. And I argue strongly it is much more sufficient than any antivirus on my system. And I will demonstrate to you why. So DNS firewall is effective, real time, centralized self-defense for your company and other cooperating parties at low cost. You can DNS, uh, you can have DNS open source, okay? Built in 15 minutes, it would be your centralized choking point. We believe that firewall is choking point. Firewall cannot perform as good as DNS. And DNS also can operate with IPs. So you actually have something fundamental under your control. And you can see the logs. If somebody hits the entry, which you believe should not be touched, it is 100% hit. And you guys and girls actually uh, are tired of the false positives. Here, there's no false positives. If somebody wants to go abc.xyz and you believe they shouldn't go there, drop your coffee, wake up and go and take a look. This is 100% hit, there's no false positives. Why would somebody ask that question without a reason? How often you call your telephone provider asking for number of, I don't know, Joe Blow? Never. Okay, uh, let's continue. Protective DNS, number three. Yes, we do have cloud DNS providers and they offer some filtering. I already mentioned that uh, UK government and US government have a strong recommendation on protective DNS. And they recommend it not only to the organizations, but they recommend it to uh, private uh, sector, to private citizens. In UK though, it is not available. Yes, you can use uh, one of the recommended cloud provider if you want to. And of course, not uh, every household would be able to run their own uh, uh, DNS, right? But you already have heard the reasoning why you potentially should consider that. And especially if your large organization, a uh, cloud solution perhaps is not for you because based on your queries of your large user base, someone would be able to imply or derive the activities of your organization. For example, what can come uh, to my mind? Uh, mergers and acquisitions, for example, divestments, okay? Uh, search for new CEO, those things which can affect the market, right? And well-being of your company. So why would you outsource this uh, 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 strong um, uh, information towards someone you may not necessarily uh, have a contractual obligation or control over? If you remember this uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, right? They said that uh, based on 10 likes or something, they may know about you more than your family members. If you're doing mergers and acquisition, you're doing your due diligence, how many likes or uh, DNS queries you would have been doing during that period. Not only they would know about your company more than your family members, but they would know about you more than your grave enemies. And this is what the potential uh, challenge here would be. Even if you use a DOH, Yes, site observer may not be able to see it. You as incident responder wouldn't be able to do anything, okay? Because it was designed to circumvent it. But those who are on the receiving end would know about you everything. This is a statement of fact, okay? We may argue how good or bad that is and whether it is acceptable for you. But uh, if it's not, then the question would be, what exactly you would be doing 
Well, if you are about from the uh, crowd, which are uh, concerned, which is concerned, the crowd which is concerned about these topics, there's DNS firewall, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. When there were times when everyone ran their own DNS, and uh, many, many years ago, uh, I did run my own for several companies when I was his admin, and the DNS logs uh, presented uh, me with a wealth of information. I was able to really uh, kind of manage my environment. Uh, you remember Blaster, you uh, remember Slammer, you remember all those things I do as well. And if you don't, well, you, you Google. And DNS was helping me and network monitoring, okay? So what's going on on my network? Okay, who is talking to whom? Uh, I had two monitors, DNS logs uh, and network uh, uh, communications. And I would tell you uh, on my watch, we have never lost data in any company I served. Not because I'm so cool, but because I used the right tools, which I believed and still do, are the most powerful because they use the fundamental protocols, okay? The fundamental things which fuel the internet. So from the history, okay, the federation and automation publish and subscribe model that what is in heart and the fundamental idea of the uh, DNS firewall or protective DNS or RPC response policy and so on. And that DNS firewall protocols are DNS TAP and DNS RPC. So what are those things? Let's go uh, here. DNS TAP, bring your... Uh, 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 queries and information about what's going on within the DNS, or your recursive DNS, then some analysis and then the response policy, bring that back, okay? And it is being done on publish subscribe. So in real time, in real time. So what happening is that you can inform your DNS server on fly. Tell me please, how much time it would take to update a one rule on your corporate firewall. If you have, can your firewall has, I don't know, I have, um, uh, I don't know, 20 what, 20, uh, let's say 5,000 rules. So can your firewall have uh, uh, 20, thousand rules, probably not. But if you try to update, it may take, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes longer. I remember uh, uh, working with the firewall team for large uh, telco. Uh, they did updates of firewall rules, IP firewall rules, once a day, unless it was absolutely necessary. Uh, and it took them maybe 30, 45 minutes to update. It was 2010, 2008. So what I would like to say is that if you have DNS and you have RPC, it zone updates, and you have this incremental thing and it done in real time. I will show you that as well. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about RPC. RPC here, RPC there, it was invented by us by Dr. Paul Vixie, who couldn't attend today, who is a co-author of this presentation, and Mr. Schreier, back in 2010. They were at ISC uh, at the time, International Security Consortium, and they prototype RPZ, and now it is in bind DNS. Bind is open source, RPZ is free feature. And it has been matured since then for 10 years. Paul Macapetris, Dr. Paul Macapetris is in our uh, uh, board, Farsight board, and he is inventor of DNS. So there's no one, and Paul Vixie, Dr. Paul Vixie, was a maintainer of BIND for many, many years. So there's no one on this planet knows about this more than we do. That's why we can tell you with authority about what we are just talking to you today. Now, 
the RPC is presented with an unbound node power DNS, and of course, bind I already mentioned. Okay, subscribe uh, and uh, publish. Publish, subscribe. It could be done in real time. Even commercial appliances have now adopted RPC. For example, Infoblox has had, uh, uh, I think, protective uh, uh, threat, threat kind of, I don't remember all of them. There are many, there's a lot of uh, vendors who now offer that. And there are many different uh, RPC uh, uh, feeds and, and methods F against malware, against uh, advertisements, if you don't like them, well, who does? Uh, against uh, botnets, bogons, COVID, uh, newly uh, appearing uh, assets on the internet. There are many of those. It's not IETF effort, but uh, uh, RFC uh, has been drafted and periodically updated. So this is quite mature technology, quite mature solution, and not only mature, you can mature useless things, right? You can mature useless things over time and continue using it because nothing else you can do. This one not only mature, but it is useful. It can protect you in real time or near real time in, in certain scenarios, which I showed you, okay? It can be more powerful because of the design and distributed nature of it um, than uh, many other solutions, including IP firewall. Okay, what are the implications of this? The implications of this uh, are that you would need to run your own DNS or ask your DNS uh, uh, operator to do it for you. So now, if you do have a, a great relationship with your even cloud provider, okay, and cloud provider gives you very specific uh, set of services, and you can actually influence what is that you're being offered, and in return, you receive DNS logs, right? And that solution is tailored for you, and you uh, have contractual obligations, Go for it. The only uh, thing you now need to uh, uh, continue to consider is that centralized solution. It was not how DNS was designed, okay? And in case of failure, it could be catastrophic. You need to evaluate that risk, okay? So in uh, UK financial industry, uh, the cloud um, computing uh, uh, has so-called concentration risk. Uh, for absence of better terms, consider concentration risk, okay? When solution designed to be distributed is being used centrally. All right, it is subscriptions and they are controlled by so-called TSIC. Uh, it is transaction signature. Most of those are free. You can find high quality anti-malware, anti-phishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, feeds, which will update uh, your DNS server or DNS server will be updated automatically, okay, on subscription, publish subscription basis, almost in real time. Some are being updated once in 24 hours. If let's say you want to use a feed from a uh, far side, the minute we see stuff, we'll let you know. And that would be called a newly observed domains. And I will touch on that as well. Remember, I mentioned before, the assets which are new on the internet uh, are not necessarily safe, up to 70%. That's the figure you need to keep in mind. So if you have a stream of new assets on the internet, if you randomly pick up one, up to 70% accuracy, you, know, you would say it is bad or not safe. I wouldn't say bad. It's not safe for your business, for your household to deal with. Let it mature, let it sit on the side for a little bit until somebody would know uh, how that uh, asset would behave, okay? And a lot of threat researchers publish feeds. Some of those are on subscription commercial basis. Some are on, uh, on free basis. And, and uh, it's very powerful. You, you, you can use it, you can use it uh, out of the box in 10, 15 minutes. I'll show you that. 
Okay, and if you enable that, of course, uh, the market for it is, is unconstrained. Remember in UK, in UK, uh, UK government since 2017 encouraged businesses and public to use protective DNS. Okay, so businesses, uh, including small businesses. And in UK, we have a top 10 uh, uh, security things which uh, you would need to do to demonstrate that your security uh, are very uncautious. Uh, to do that to, uh, 10 things for small business could be unaffordable. Okay, could be unaffordable. So does it mean that you would be exposed if protective DNS is not available for private sector? Well, probably not. DNS is fundamental protocol, run your own uh, things uh, as a small business on Raspberry Pi, and in 50 uh, uh, pounds, UK pounds, uh, you would be able to run something that is far more powerful than corporate firewall. And that is not an exaggerated statement, okay? And you would be private. So now, uh, what is the market for this? Well, market for this is very simple. In UK, we have over 5 million small businesses. Small business is defined as up to 50 uh, employees. So of course, if you have 50 employees, you cannot afford cybersecurity program, uh, audit compliance. It is very heavy for you. What if you have, I don't know, a farm or a foundry, uh, uh, it's not your core business, right? If you have a budget 5,000, it could be uh, three days of uh, some consultant for you. So how can you do that? Well, there are solutions. Now, among those five plus million small businesses in the UK, they comprise 99.2% of all businesses in my country. Of course, it's unconstrained size. The opportunities for this powerful defense is out there. If you are uh, entrepreneurial, just keep it in mind, okay? You can share with your friends pre-built image for Raspberry Pi, they stick it in and they go. All you need to do is to help them configure their home router, so the home router would talk not to their uh, ISP uh, DNS, but to their own uh, DNS under the table or in the closet. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about DNS RPG. Uh, we have at Farsight, at my day job, uh, several of those. We call them newly observed, newly observed domains. And those uh, uh, feeds might be 10, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, a couple of hours, 24 hours, and so on. Uh, you remember, if you take a newly observed uh, assets on the internet, randomly pick up to 70% is not good, not safe. So what if we just deny access to this new asset, let's say for 24 hours. In 24 hours, 80% of those will disappear, so therefore, if something new would hit you and you blindly deny access to it, you would be safer. And the only assumption you need to put in place is that there is no legitimate reason for anybody to go to new assets on the internet immediately. There are some edge cases, but I am sure you would be able to understand what they are. And if not 24 hours, if 24 hours for your business is too much, you can do it for 30 minutes. For example, Vixi uh, runs uh, RPC uh, and Odin, you'll observe domains uh, in his environment for, if I remember correctly, like 10 minutes or three minutes, and he believes that's sufficiently enough. I run for 24 hours and I feel absolutely uh, uh, good about it. It has no a single uh, click uh, during my regular work where I clicked on something and I so desperately need it and I just shut down my DNS. It was one case though, and I will tell you about this maybe right now. <laughs> This one, 
I think it's quite appropriate to say about it. My wife received an email from NHS, National Health Services. If you look at this email on the left, it looks exactly as if I actually received it from the government. The only difference is that it is not my name here. Usually they do. And of course, my wife didn't look at this, but who does? How often you do it? Well, we are professionals and we don't do it. What you can imagine from the regular public. Of course, you want to have a, a COVID passport. So she clicked on this link, click on that button. She did that. And then she calls me, hey, Boris, internet is not working. Well, it works for me, right? This is how we respond. Oh, it works for me. Uh, and then I ask exactly what is not working. What? I clicked on this button. Oh, yes, of course you clicked on this button. What happened? When I started Robel shirt, I asked, hey, DNS server, can you tell me where this domain is sitting? Because that was behind this button, right? This domain. And look at this. NHS apps sort. Looks legit, right? Application, certification, passport, NHS, look legit. And I ask by default my home recursive DNS. And my home recursive DNS says, hey, that domain doesn't exist and gives me nothing. It shows me a finger. And it was response policy zone, 24 hours response policy zone. What happened? Farsight Security observed this to be a new domain and inform everyone across the world who subscribed for that feed, for that RPZ, all their DNS servers, that this is new. And depending on your policy, you decide what to do with this. I decided not to go there. So my wife's web browser appeared as not working because internet is not working. Because before you go somewhere, you need to go to DNS. And DNS says no NX, no domain, NX domain, not existing domain. But when I tried a very, very popular open public DNS server, it gave me the IP. I got IP from a many or almost all, not almost all. It gave me IP from many, but all public DNSs I tested, including my provider. What it means is if my wife used that specific uh, default DNS, which is elsewhere, she would be able to go to that website and perhaps submit whole her history, firstborn, uh, credit cards, everything, whatever they asked, right? Now look at the time. It is 8.25 and this is 9.08. I made the screenshot realizing that it would be a good example. But between she received this email, clicked on the link and asking me, it was maybe, I don't know, five, seven minutes past. So now, if you believe that your takedown service okay, is effective uh, measure, think twice. Regular users would visit those malicious thing, especially if they're well crafted, very quickly. You would not be able to go and back them all, all across the internet, all the web servers which you believe need to be taken down or domains need to be taken down. But if you use this, in this specific case, internet will disappear from you. What you can do here, you can actually lend the user into the wall garden saying, look, that most likely a malicious email. If you believe otherwise, please contact our incident response or security or SOC, whatever the, uh, and the, and the, the department in your environment is. And if you don't do that, but you watch for DNS uh, logs, you would see, aha, Boris's wife tried to access something that is not likely safe. And they would be able to contact Boris's wife and say, hey, what are you trying to access? That's probably not safe. And so on, whatever your incident response procedure is. All right, where we are, we are here. Uh, I just jumped forward and then I, I, I'm going back. This is how that could be done immediately. And this is what um, Farsight Security does. There are many other DNS providers 
and uh, of course uh, for you it is uh, to choose from uh, we have 500 sensors all across the globe uh, very rarely we don't see something that somebody else sees. But even though you bring all the passive DNS providers uh, together, there would be corners of the internet which no one of us would see. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to uh, to see uh, uh, to to use different providers. For example, somebody could be very cheap but would uh, give you uh, a set of data which would require a lot of cleanup. Or you can have somebody who is more expensive, for example, a far side uh, on that side, uh, but uh, the, the data is crisp clean, very, very little glitches there. So you, you would decide. If you cannot afford, we have grant program. So if you're a researcher, uh, we would give it for you for free. Okay, and if you contribute into our database by having a sensor in your environment, which is above recursive, so we don't see your PII, right? So you share with us questions and answers, we have very heavy discounts. But again, this is not a sales talk. This is something for you uh, to consider. All right, uh, what are those uh, kind of uh, events in DNS RPZ? Right. Uh, we will build with you today a DNS firewall using IOC to RPZ public project, free one, okay? So you can use this. Uh, we also were able to build PyHole and AdGuard, okay? On bind DNS with RPZ. So we would have two we would have two uh, uh, systems. If you use, for example, PyHole AdGuard, you would use their uh, uh, feeds plus RPZ from Farsight, okay? This is how I built uh, uh, one of my uh, recursive DNS. And another one is on uh, IOC to RPZ. I am happy to show you that, right? So this is my IOC to RPZ. See, no tracking, block list, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is no. These are the feeds, and these are the uh, hits here. We will not go through this at the moment. But what I would like to say, uh, say this is one DNS server running at my environment. This is another DNS server, and both are running on uh, on bind. Okay, but I do prefer this one. AdGuard is cool, but neither PyHole or AdGuard were designed for security. IOC uh, to RPZ was designed for security, and IOC to RPZ gives you uh, ability to dig to the log. So if you're a small business or you have a friend who would want to use it, or maybe you at home, uh, among those, I definitely would recommend IEC to RPZ. Very easy to set up, one click, 15 minutes, you're done. So Threat Stop, this is the one which I uh, forgot. Threat Stop has kind of a personal DNS. So you go there, you download, and your internal uh, Windows stack would not use any other DNS server, but would use Threat Stop with the kind of personal DNS server. You can run it on your uh, Android system as well. So it is not uh, uh, energy or, uh, or resource uh, hungry. It can be done uh, with no kind of uh, real hassle. So that is the thing. So we will definitely go through Q&A right after this session, and then it, it would be a demo. Uh, this is, as I already mentioned, is your RPZ DNS firewall on Raspberry Pi. I showed you this interface. And we will go through this. One of those RPZ feeds is, uh, uh, is uh, FSI NOD, Farsight Security. Inc, FSI, NOD, newly observed domain, 24 hours RPZ. Okay, so I run all of them, I run all of them on my Raspberry Pi, over 10 million uh, rules. I think if you try to have it in your corporate firewall, uh, just to, uh, to apply them, may take maybe several weeks, I think. I don't know, I didn't run firewall for a long, long time, but 5,000 rules took like 30, 45 minutes. So I would say 
maybe your firewall will die. Again, don't quote me. I don't know. I am guessing. You try. You try. You try. You, you, you. Well, no, no, don't try. Um, don't try it at work, okay? Because if it is broken, you would blame me. Build it at home. Try it at home and then uh, share somewhere uh, uh, on the media. I have two Q&A. William asking, how do you compare bind RPZ with pipehole DNS? Is bind RPZ more flexible? All right. So pipehole uses its own DNS and that DNS doesn't have RPZ. So you cannot RPZ in anything through this. So for that, what you do, uh, what you do would be this one. You go to labs, forum labsfsi.io. You register there, okay? And you search for the blog post called industry grade government recommended DNS firewall on Raspberry Pi with Pi hole or ad guard for ad blocker. So those two were designed to be ad blockers. For them, you build a first, okay? I'll show you, okay, very quickly. So for that, first you build your uh, uh, operating system. For example, uh, uh, Ubuntu, I use Ubuntu. Okay, on Raspberry Pi. So once you build it, you configure uh, some stuff. And once you did that, you have now your IP stack, and then now you have its own internal DNS. Then you install bind to RPZ, okay, to have RPZ. And you mount bind, okay, you mount bind on a different port. And I will show you where that is. I, I will show you where that is. For bind, you need to, uh, I will not waste your time. So because internal DNS is running on port 53 when you install it, if you continue to run bind on port 53, it would be broken and it would require special knowledge and skills to actually fix it. So operating system updated, put bind on it with some prerequisites, you will go through the log, and then you explain to bind to be run on a different port. I use 5335. Uh, I will show you here, settings maybe, settings, DNS. So I use bind on port 5335, okay? So now you have a operating system, you have internal DNS, you don't touch, you have bind uh, listening on 5335, okay? And then you install pi-hole or add guard. And during the installation, you say, hey, your upstream DNS server is not quad nine, quad one or whatever, but is this one, your local one, okay? and then you're in business. So what it means is your pie hole, right, would be using all the feeds it has, right, all the feeds it has from pie hole, but RPZ would be on DNS and both would be working, okay? The same would be with AdGuard, and again, AdGuard uh, would uh, have a uh, different view. So this is your pie hole, this is how to do it, this is, you know, do-it-yourself instructions blog post, right? And this is how you would uh, see it in AdGuard as well, okay? That's your blog post. But today, we will be using not uh, uh, PyHole uh, or AdGuard. We'll be using IOC to RPZ. And again, this is also blog post here. And I will go through it. So, William. Uh, I hope I answered your question and it's a bit longer, but I think it is a very good question, okay? So you need to make sure that first install bind, reassign the port, and then continue if you do want to use PyHole, okay? Mine asking, in your experience, how amount of systems, resources, CPU, memory is required for 
500 peers in a corporate environment. Right, okay, <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, I have my home router, which is a quite powerful uh, OpenVRT uh, router. Okay, uh, last model, last model. Let me see uh, which one, uh, 192, 168, uh, uh, sorry, 81. Sorry, 81. GLI. Okay, this is my router very powerful uh, little box. And I tried, so my DNS uh, is, uh, my, my Raspberry is uh, connected directly to this DNS. And I started uh, a stress test. I think I was making like 50, maybe 100 queries per second. I would say if you have 500 peers in your corporate, unlikely you would have uh, 100 queries per second, unlikely. I think unlikely, okay, in the regular working hours. So I did the stress test. So what happened, my router died, okay? So my router died before then my, uh, my pie hole, okay, or my DNS. You don't need to have pie hole, right? But if you do, you would have it, right? So my DNS server was healthy. How do I know? Because I know the memory usage and I uh, have, so this has four gig of memory, but my, uh, this one has uh, eight gig of memory. So eight gig of memory, right? Memory use is 6%. This is my CPU load. So when I started it, well, it went like 20%, maybe 30%, but it was far away from, from being dead or not uh, responding. My router died first. To answer your question, I don't know exactly how would 500 peers in the corporate environment would behave, but for 500 peers, you unlikely would use a, a Raspberry Pi. Your boss wouldn't let you do it. Right, you probably would have some kind of a virtual machine with a little bit more uh, memory and resources, but DNS servers are not demanding for resources as let's say firewall. So you would need to have memory to keep all the things uh, in memory for fast responses. From CPU perspectives, well, it's not very, uh, uh, very, very demanding, but when I did like up to 100 uh, things, it came to 20, 30% of uh, CPU usage. All right, uh, uh, good questions. I say answer live, answer live. And uh, if you have uh, more or I have not answered, you believe, just let me know and we will continue. So it says still, okay, I say done. I say done. If you believe I didn't answer, then you just uh, uh, let me know. Let me say uh, here, see here what's going on. Oops. Uh, please help me with the link so that I can follow through later. Uh, which link? Uh, all the links, uh, I will give you a screenshot and also it is in the presentation. But if you tell me what exact link, I'm happy, happy uh, to do that. Please help me with what, oh yes, I think I understand which link. Uh, labs.fsi.io, this is our labs. But forum is one of the icon when you register to labs, but it would be forum dot fsi dot io i think that is uh, correct let me see yes and i give you the link now you would have a a window which would uh, invite you to register oh not this one sorry i need to do it for everyone okay right and sorry this one and and this one. All right, perfect. So you would have a pop-up window, create your account. Uh, if you try to have anonymous email, I will block you because we would like to make sure that we can verify the users for obvious reasons, right? Because there are some things on that uh, forum which probably we wouldn't want to have publicly available. For example, some research on uh, solar wind, et cetera, et cetera. Go, 
uh, go and check uh, what we found in our database about solar wind. I have not seen anywhere else. So if you are into it, you can you can you can get that. Okay, so these are the uh, email, uh, sorry, uh, web links um, to resources which I mentioned. If you want to learn more about DNSRPZ, DNSRPZ.info, uh, what can be uh, more, more uh, uh, obvious, right? DNS tab info, I told you about that. Labs FSI, uh, I already mentioned that for you. And this is a uh, YouTube video when uh, Dr. Vixi uh, was presenting, I think it's Thailand. Uh, we wanted to make a demo very quickly and uh, uh, I just recorded what, what, what I usually present and it is there. It's a little bit rough maybe, but it would give you idea. I'll show you, uh, I have shown there kind of a real life, uh, real time uh, uh, things which are uh, going on. Uh, are there any other questions? Because we have another 30 minutes uh, uh, to, uh, to have a demo, how to build this uh, DNS firewall. So please let me know if you are uh, curious about something else and I am happy to answer questions uh, for you. In the meantime, I'll try my uh, preparation here. I believe that uh, I believe that uh, my presentation would be available. So you would be able to see all those links. If not, make a screenshot and we can go. So I give you a second to, uh, to take some um, breath and we will continue. I will show you how you can do stuff which I described yourself because otherwise what would be the point, right? Okay, so I think I'm a little bit tired and I click too many buttons. Come on, come on. Yes, perfect. Yeah, we're not responding, it's responding. So instead of building on the um, on Raspberry Pi from the very beginning, uh, it is really absolutely uh, the same and it doesn't really matter whether you build it on Raspberry Pi or not. By end of this process, by end of this process, you would have industry grade. This is not a speculation or exaggeration. This is a fact, government recommended. It's a fact. DNS firewall, it's a fact. On Raspberry Pi, yes, if you follow this blog, but I would be doing the same thing on, uh, on VM because it's just easy, okay? Clone it, etc. it's just easy for the presentations and it's managed by IOC to RPZ, okay? So you will go and read and it's very, very, very easy. If you find some discrepancy, leave it in a comment, we will improve it, but this is what we will be doing. Okay, so first, first we need to build a, a, a system of your choice. My choice was Ubuntu uh, version 2004. So I will start this uh, running, okay? And at this time, uh, by uh, time it would be booted, uh, it is as if we have this, right? So welcome to Ubuntu. This Ubuntu is on Raspberry Pi but uh, it doesn't need to be, okay? This is right after the boot, I got this, that's why it's 11% uh, 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 memory usage and a usage of the uh, disk is 41%. I use a uh, eight gig card because it's much easier because if you have a big card, then uh, when, you, when you clone it, you have four gig of uh, thing, right? And another like 128 of stuff, which is empty. I don't recommend that, okay? Now, this is parameters, right? Whilst it's booting, so 41%. And I specifically bought a kit from Amazon, okay? Everything is one. So as if I have no clue what I'm doing, and this is my first time, right? So it's just a standard plastic box without any heat sinks, anything. And temperature, even in the summertime, uh, didn't go above, I don't know, 50, uh, 50 uh, Celsius degrees, okay? So now we have our, uh, our, uh, our uh, system. This is vanilla system, 
okay, with full updates on it. So when you do it on uh, on uh, on the sorry, when you do it on uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, watch. First time you boot it, it starts out to update, which probably could be a little bit annoying, but uh, don't interrupt. Okay, don't interrupt. Read the blog and everything you would uh, have there is there. Now, I did not assign any static IP, anything with is under DHCP on its own. Okay, so let's see if I can come here. I should be able to, let's see. I cloned it yesterday and maybe IP is different. No, IP is not different. Here we go. Okay, perfect. So what I have done, right? I logged in to this system. Why? Because you see 192, 160, 214, 128. This is IP of my virtual machine, right? My virtual machine. Okay, I don't need it anymore. I don't need it anymore. I just minimize this and we will be using SSH because it's easy copy paste. Okay. All right, what next? Next, uh, we will be going uh, and register on that's exciting stuff indeed. On HTTPS, IUC to RPZ. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So if you go here, we signed up, but of course I wouldn't because I already have my, uh, my, uh, my account. Okay, so these are some news, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is uh, things which I do because I already have uh, uh, RPZ uh, feeds from here. So these are 13 million rules. Okay, so this is what I use, right? So what I will be doing, I will show you the RPZ feeds so adult free before ai so once we announced at first sight that we would be using we would be giving the community free feed it's still not ready for some reasons because um we recently was acquired by domain tools exciting stuff but uh, when two universes merges right there's some things which uh, still need to be solved right so the, the <laughs> instead of two black holes one has to be formed it's forming and then gravitational waves so so we are at the gravitational waves at the moment, very exciting stuff, and, and community feed would be coming. Okay, so sorry about that, but it would be coming. But once we announced that, before I, I also created the RPZ feed. All right, so you have a community which will support you against malware, malicious sites, bug on IPs, DGAs, the domain generation algorithms. How cool is that? So if your environment among those 500 things which you mentioned in your question would go some DGA, it is 100% uh, a reason for your concern, okay? And many, many others here. Why Farsight is not here? Because Farsight is a real time, RPZ feed using IXFR technology. This is subscribe, uh, uh, publish, subscribe thing in real time. Okay. Uh, that's why it is in custom feeds. So you go here and you say, hey, I would like to have Farsight. We have either commercial, right, or community feed. You would need to provide here, right, uh, a key name if you subscribe. Right, you pick up your HMAC and this is your transaction signature key. Now, some of you may say, hmm, let me try. 
you make a screenshot, you try, and it wouldn't work. That is commercial fit. And we not only have a transaction key, but we also filter by IP. So our commercial feed is filtered by IP. So you need to be on my network, okay? to receive notification, etc., And this is our uh, uh, service. So as you can see, uh, the maintainer of IOC to RPZ, Vadim Pavlov, he already created this the way that is seamless for you. So you save it, okay? And you have this one, right? So you can verify what is that we have created. Yeah, we done. So what next? Next, you go to the next. And you have, this is my Raspberry Pi configuration, okay? With all those, uh, uh, with all those things, 13 million, okay? In this particular case, 86 million. So I probably skipped some. So 8.6 million rules in my configuration, okay? And here is our demo. In our demo, I use only Farsight uh, RPC, but you can use any other stuff if you want, okay? You can use all of them. So this virtual machine, which I shared with you, would be capable to handle uh, the load of all those uh, uh, 13 million or 8 million stuff, but we are only interested in this. So you save it. What next? Oh, well, next you do this. This is script URL. This is your URL. It uses curl. You copy this and you go to your machine. You say, um, mkdir, I am creating a, a directory for IOC to RPZ, all right? And I go there. And then I simply copy paste that script, which is already there. Here we go. All right, what I need to do now, I need to uh, make sure I can execute it. This is what I say, hey, change the mode for this. Done, so we uh, listed, see it's yellow, all good. What now? Now, now I need to execute it. And I say sudo because that script requires that. If I don't do sudo, it would uh, complain and wouldn't execute, so sudo. IOC to RPZ, ba -bam. password. Here we go. It does stuff which is required. If you are interested, you just go and read. And in fact, I encourage you to actually go and inspect the script before running something from the internet, but I know what it is, so they, I, I run. But for you, please go and inspect because, you know, somebody can trick you to execute something that will, you know, flatten and break you in environment. You don't want to do that. You only want to have something trusted. Okay. Okay. So what next? Now we need to provide a secret. I have secret on that screen and this is, I provided the secret. Once again, if you make a copy, it will not work on your environment. Come back and we will figure it out what we can do for you. All right. Is it correct? Yes. Now this will install a lock to RAM. So if you have RAM, it's better to run that thing, especially if you run it on SD cards. Okay, because read, write, read, write for SD card, make it work, and at some point it will be dead. However, I would say I run my Pi uh, for several years, okay, and I have not experienced any problems, but, but I do have log to run, okay. All my logs, all my RPZ, especially which are real time, are in memory. Okay, so I have enough RAM and those directories are in memory. So that's why I do recommend, especially if, on, uh, if you're running on um, a Raspberry Pi in here. And if you run it on regular server, give it a gig. This is one gig. If you want to run more than 10 million rules, then, you know, give it two gig. I don't think you will buy a server right now less than, I don't know, 16 or 32 gig. So be generous. That's for your speed as well. 
Now I am just sitting and have a sip of my tea because I like tea. And it will do everything for you. In the meantime, I will show you what those uh, uh, DNS uh, NOD uh, RPC feed is. E demo. So whilst on the right side, on the left side, we do the uh, installation of that stuff, I'll show you what we see. What you see here, what you see here, these are, you can feel privileged really, because what you see here, what you see here, a domain which we have never seen before. Okay. This is a domain, these are the domains which we have never seen before. What's going on here? Perhaps it was some updates which were not uh, uh, here yesterday. So boot image, etc., etc. Okay, so let's wait for that. We still have time. So these are the domains which we have never seen before. Those domains statistically, okay, any of those any of these domains, any of these domains randomly chosen, most likely up to 70% or above would be not safe to deal with. Now, because I am running my own DNS, right? Recursive DNS with RPZ, I will show you how that works, right? So you see this on the screen, and my DNS already knows about it. The difference between this and I started to uh, query it, okay, with NX domain, it was several seconds. You say, oh, that's a trick. All right, let's uh, take some, which is considered to be a very, very good server. And here's the IP. So now with 70% of certainty, okay, that IP, could be malicious. And besides, look at those, look, look, look at this. They've been created in sequence. I would suggest this is some kind of DGA, right? So let's try again, dig, da dang NOD, right? An X domain. Once again, it could be a walled garden, it could be whatever. But let's see if this is 1.1.1.1. One .1 .1 .1. Oh. Beautiful Cloudflare behind which a lot of things are happening, which a lot of security researchers and uh, incident responders complain being dodgy. Here we go. Okay, so Code 9 uh, resolved it. Uh, this is a lock. What about Google? 8.8.8.8. Here we go. What about uh, Code 4? What's going on? Are they, are they dead? I don't know what's going on. Okay, let, 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 let's go back to 999999. So anyways, that's what it is. And by time of our experiments with my home recursive DNS, hopefully I was able to convince you. If not, let's try once again. So let's go here. Let's say dig. Hey, give it to me. Ta dang. All right. So real time. Now, our system here on the left side has been created and it says, please reboot. Now, you need to remember this because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get to the web console. Now, uh, I don't wanna uh, remember this password. What I would like actually to do is to uh, change this password, okay? So you change it to whatever you like, okay? To whatever you like, and I will change it to RPI admin. So username RPI admin and password RPI admin. Not good, 
but I don't just want to go and type it in. I discourage you to use this kind of things, especially in production environment and home as well, because if let's say somebody uh, compromises your system and goes to web interface and type Ubuntu, Ubuntu, RPI admin, RPI admin, you would be doomed, okay? So be really considered to operational security. I press enter, ta-da, and I now say uh, sudo, uh, reboot now. All right, so let's see if what I do is actually uh, uh, is going on. So here we go. I am rebooting that system. Once it is rebooted, we may go and answer a couple of questions. After the demo, if you have time, would you please share a bit thought about uh, the recommended implementation of protected DNS in the network where is having DNS or HTTPS and DNS secure and DNS sex service running? And do you think the protected DNS concept will work a good synergy? All right. Cool. Uh, Hendrik, yes, I'm happy to share. And additionally, you say, the reason I was asking due to encryption of DNS, okay, signatures to existing DNS record, right, are considered as improvement to mitigate DNS-related attack. While the protected DNS, you explain. Right, okay. Yes, we will touch on that. I think these are very interesting questions. Right, and I read them kind of for myself, not for the audience. They are here, so the audience would be able to see them. But uh, let's go. So we have this. Okay, it's done. It's 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 booted. Now we would go and see whether or not. Of course, this is your environment. You need to go here and you type. RPI admin, uh, RPI admin, Tom. So what do you have? You have, okay, how can I move it? I probably need to do this, right? We don't need this one. So what do we have? We have <laughs> industry grade, government recommended, DNS firewall, which could be on Raspberry Pi. In this case, it's on, on, uh, on a virtual machine, right? We follow the instructions in, in this blog. And as you can see, it took us less than 15 minutes uh, to work. So uh, we started somewhere at 30 something, right? Uh, we have a little bit more time. And this is where we are. So this is our DNS firewall, right? 24, 128, this is where we are. All right, so let's try this. Now, because this is virtual machine and the network configuration is different, right? So I would definitely need to do something that I don't need to do for my firewall. I need to update the RPC feed, okay? I need to update this RPC feed, but in your environment, you would, you would not need to do so. Okay, so let's go and let's say, uh, do some of this. Okay, RPZ. And now we go 192, 168. Uh, what was that? 214, 214, 128. Ta-da. Okay. Yes, so we need to have this... Uh, uh, RPZ update feed, okay. And even though before that, let, let's see if everything is working here. And for that, we would check whether or not we have uh, uh, stuff actually uh, loaded, okay. To make sure that things are working. Okay. So let's say status first. Running, very good. 
And now I would like to check whether RPC feed came in here. So I'm checking this. Okay, 1453, 1453, yes. So we should be able to have at least, at least some of those which we previously had. So let, uh, let's do uh, that. Okay. Here we go, okay. So I just, queried something that I queried before, okay? Presumably it was a uh, DGA and this is no error, but it doesn't give me anything. And it is 24 hours RPZ, okay? So it works. And the beauty of this is that you would be able to see it in your log. It might or might not be yet updated. Okay, see, I had two uh, uh, queries here. Okay, I reboot, ten, 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 block request. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay. So it was allowed because it was before of the uh, of the RPC if it was updated, but because we had a bunch of queries for my home DNS, we should be able to see, uh, we should uh, should be able to see 24 hours RPC. See, I got those things: Q name and X domain. If you're a security uh, uh, analyst, security uh, responders, incident responders, your DNS server would have similar logs. You don't need to use uh, IOC to RPC, but for home, for free, please say thanks to Vadim Pavlov, who actually made it available for everyone. I, I, I highly recommend it. It is definitely something that worthwhile to take a look. Statistics, etc. So you have something in here. You can make point, and you can go Google virus total, etc. Beautiful. And Vadim is very, very uh, responsive to uh, questions and recommendations. So please go there and uh, and help him to develop. Uh, suggestions, features, requests, and so on. All right, uh, now I don't like this uh, screens. I don't need uh, this screens. Let us for the question. Okay, the question was, after the demo, if you have time, would you please share a bit thoughts about the recommended implementation of protected DNS in a network where is having DNS over HTTP? Okay, so let's say you have a network if I correctly understand that, okay? And you have all the systems talking to your recursive DNS over HTTPS. If that is okay, then that's fine because your recursive DNS can receive encrypted uh, uh, queries and still use RPC, the one which I have shown you, okay? And you still would, because that DNS is under your control. So now if this DNS is under your control, uh, I still not quite uh, clear uh, to come up with the use case. Why would you need to, you, to use encrypted DNS inside your environment? Maybe it's your policy, maybe uh, whatever that would be. If you like to run it, please run it. Once again, if it is your recursive DNS, you would be able to do the RPC on that DNS. If you have contracted party, and you are doing this uh, uh, stuff to contracted party, uh, they would run RPZ for you, fine. If you have access to their logs, right? It doesn't matter because you would see, you would see that some stuff, right? Was, was queried over some policy. And then you would be able to take some measures for or against those to enforce it, okay? Now, when we talk about DNSSEC, I assume 
that the question was about you running DNSSEC. Well, this is as authoritative, right? So then you would have, uh, uh, so DNSSEC was uh, predominantly uh, designed uh, against spoofing and, uh, and uh, poisoning, right? So because of the signature. Uh, again, in the scenario which I described, you should have no uh, problems. I'm just not sure whether I answer your questions or not. Uh, if yes, uh, tell me something. If not, you can take it offline. What is the process running uh, running showing domains in continue, please? Is it RPC or what is the process running? Yes, so what I showed you is a DNS server, operating system, DNS server, recursive DNS server, which has RPC feed, or many of those, if you want, from IOC to RPZ or any other, you can go and find those on the internet. They're very high quality ones, some real time, some uh, uh, periodically updated. Farsight is real time, I showed you that, okay? And then on top of it, uh, this uh, RPI, this is uh, uh, IOC to RPZ. This is just a, a GUI interface, which helps you to run it without command line visualization, statistics, uh, uh, some logs, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is my whole stuff. This is what I can see what's going on, right? Uh, what queries were there? Some blockers, see? Malware bytes, want to report uh, to malware bytes, what is that I'm doing? Why would I need to do it? I just don't like it. So it is in one of the RPC feed from IOC to RPC. How is IOC to be sustained? How long has it been running? Okay, IOC to RPC has several years. Do I have it? Okay, RPC is it? Is it okay? IOC to RPC is several years. Okay, it is uh, uh, free to use. It is based on donations, and uh, we uh, at Farsight really would like to make it more sustainable and we consider how we can support IOC to RPZ uh, uh, to be more sustainable, okay? Uh, it would uh, likely continue to be for free, let's see, 2020 and so on and so on, you, you, yeah, a couple of years. So now uh, IOC to RPZ has, I think, maybe up to a hundred customers, maybe more, right? But once you, once you download and execute the script, Right. These things definitely would be updated through IOC to RPZ. But when you learn how to run it, you would be able to consume different RPC feeds from anybody else. Okay. This is just a, a, a cool thing to start, right? But if you have a commercial, uh, let's say, uh, ideas, you can reach Vadim and maybe have more than uh, three different configurations right, for, for different environments. I hope, I hope I answered your questions. Oh, Hendrik, thank you, uh, great. I also have um, a couple of questions here. Home, okay, thank you. Uh, did I answer or I didn't? Maina, yes, no, because hmm means hmm, uh, probably, but okay, I will be polite and I just smile and say, okay, fine. So yes, no? Okay, let me know. Okay, so what we have here, aha. Uh -huh. Yes, you answered those, perfect. So I say, uh, answer, done, answer, done, anonymous. How is uh, sustained? I think I already answered that question. Answer done. I personally donated to uh, IOC to RPZ when I discovered it, and they I recommended it to uh, uh, for Farsight to uh, to kind of uh, I wouldn't say uh, kind of uh, make a partnership, but during the presentations to actually mention IOC to RPZ and make a demo with it, because among many others. Pi-hole, Edgar, uh, and uh, IOC to RPZ. IOC to RPZ was the only one who responded to my query for collaboration, okay? So therefore, all kudos to Vadim because he was great and he was able to really make uh, uh, this thing happen. Not for me, 
not for Farsight, for you, right? Because you can now you can go here and in one click use something that was not possible to do before. Okay. What is the process running showing domains in? Uh, uh, what is the process running showing domains in? Oh, I see. Uh, right. Are you asking? Uh, Okay, so I think I understand what you're asking. Come on, yes. So you were asking, you were asking, about this. So these are different uh, feeds. These are our observation from Farsight Security. This is so-called channel 212, which is newly observed domains. So as I mentioned, these domains are those which no one ever saw before. So if you ask anyone, you're the first who see it, okay? This is above 99.9% .9 certainty. What new means is that we saw it uh, being asked somewhere, not zone files. Somebody actually asked to resolve this domain somewhere. So it become live, okay? And we now check. 10 years back to our DNS DB, so-called DNS DB, passive DNS database, whether we saw it or not. If we don't, we put it here, we report it here. So these are all new. So this one, VPN reviews. Based on my experience, it's most likely some kind of phishing stuff. Okay. So what else we have? Because this is not the only one. Okay. We have newly observed hosts. It's not domains, these are hosts. This one are hosts. And this is one in 100. So we observed 100, but we report only one, right? And this at the top, it's a feed which goes directly into database. So in one second, we observed approximately 50,000 uh, 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 entities, as you can see, one in 10,000, right? So there's 10,000 passed and we pick up one, 10,000, we pick up one and we put it on this screen. This is a demo, but you can subscribe to these feeds commercially if you like, and you would be able to feed them, for example, into your uh, seam, I don't know, Splunk, Right, especially especially if let's say you talk about newly absorbed domains, right? So you can take this feed, put it in your email server. So don't talk to those uh, MX records which are in that domain because they're new for a certain time. Okay, so you reduce spam significantly. Okay, you tell your Splunk to watch for that. Good. So if something happens, you have an alert, and of course you consume this as an RPC feed into your DNS server, and therefore whoever goes there wouldn't be able to go. I demonstrated this, right? Internet doesn't work. But I would recommend to you something like World Garden, so a nice page, corporate page, which would explain to user what needs to be done. Very easy to do, okay? If you, if you go to one of the uh, resources which I showed you here, or PZ here, it will tell you how to implement the history, how to work with the uh, uh, wall gardens, etc., etc. So I consider this answered. This one is done. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, this one is done. All right, there is no more questions I see, and there is nothing in the chat. And I see 23 people, but we are eight minutes late. So if I was not too talkative uh, and things uh, run a little bit faster, I would suggest that uh, uh, more people would uh, stay. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I really appreciate all of your attention here. Fantastic questions. And I need to say goodbye to all of you. Uh, if you want to reach me over the uh, LinkedIn, please do. Uh, my email address would be in the chat for everyone, if you like that as well. I put it for everyone. It would be fsi.io. Please uh, 
LinkedIn with me. And with that, I would need to stop sharing. And Grace potentially would click stop button. And all the kudos to you. It was excellent session. I really appreciate it. We run over two hours, but I do appreciate your, uh, your staying and learning. I thought it would be 10 minutes break, but we didn't have any. Hopefully it was uh, okay and I didn't put you asleep. Grace, back to you.